If you joined, welcome. Uh, this topic may or may not be on your radar as a small business or as an entrepreneur, but in this uh, very sensitive social climate, it is vital to be aware and clear to your market about your position. Uh, and there are some key benefits to being inclusive as a business uh, that can impact your viability and your bottom line. So it's not just a nice to do thing, it's, it's very important. Uh, so in today's presentation, we will, uh, let me see here. Yeah, we will define and discuss the concept of inclusion. So we'll talk about what it is. Uh, we'll examine the various aspects of, uh, and considerations in your business to being inclusive. So we'll talk about how you do it. And then we'll sum up with a review of the benefits uh, to making your business more inclusive, which is the why. So we'll talk about the what, how, and why of uh, making your business more inclusive. It is very likely that you have had some experiences yourself in your business uh, issues or dealings. Um, and if you have something to interject, please do so. We want this to be uh, an open dialogue and we welcome anything that you can add to the presentation. So starting with uh, defining what it is uh, to be an inclusive business, uh, an inclusive business looks to establish a sense of belonging for everyone, accepting and celebrating all communities in their marketplace. Uh, so what does this mean? What does this take into consideration? There's a small list on the side and it is not entirely comprehensive, but these are sort of the big buckets that we uh, recognize. Uh, BIPOC, meaning Black, Indigenous, People of Color, uh, all races and cultures. Um, and when we talk about, you know, what is the difference between those? Well, you know, it can be the French versus English culture. It can be uh, the Muslim culture. It can be all sorts of examples. Um, we also talk about persons with disabilities, and of course, we would, you know, lean on Brett for some information on this in his business, um, but it is certainly part of the inclusion discussion, uh, LGBTQ+, God, I hope I put those in the right order, um, that's obviously come to the forefront in our social climate, and then women's representation, and it's funny that this is at the bottom of the list, when actually that is, you know, they are not in order of importance by any means, but it's the women's movement that has beaten a path for many of these other communities and set a template on, you know, uh, establishing more equality and establishing more inclusion uh, in the business world. So um, it's a lot to, to consider, but it's important that we think of all aspects of inclusion. So as a business, your goal is to foster that market engagement and build a community of clients and supporters and, and uh, any kind of perceived or intended discrimination against any members of your marketplace can quickly turn that community against you. Uh, so it's not necessarily your corporate mission to champion for the rights or representation of any specific group, uh, but what you should represent is empathy and encourage diversity in your various business elements to be on the team. Uh, and to be more specific, inclusion is not, so this is important, inclusion is not a set it and forget it policy. Um, it's an ever changing discussion. It's a very fluid concept. Uh, and some things that 20 years ago we would have said are okay are not okay anymore. Uh, so, you know, to be, to be absolutely part of the right discussion, it's something that is on an ongoing process. It's not just hiring quotas and mandates. Uh, that might have been uh, a practice that they used to break down barriers of, uh, of inclusion in the past but we've seen some of the negative impacts of those as well. And it's not just making sure you have a token representative of each community uh, in your company. Uh, it's much more than that. It's not an automatic right of way for certain groups or individuals um, based on the social climate. It's, it's more of an open discussion and, and a group decisions. And it's not a reactive strategy to just avoiding problems. So the blue text is the really important stuff. I have to change my display so I can actually read it. Um, inclusion is a business culture that promotes an open dialogue with leadership, staff, customers, and the general public to continuously improve in the spirit of fairness and togetherness. Uh, so that's really what we're talking about in defining what uh, inclusion is uh, for our businesses. Any input at this point before we move on into the business considerations? Uh, no. Okay. So now we've built a clear definition of what it means to be inclusive as a business, let's look at how we go about implementing the concept in the various aspects of our business. And we'll start with leadership. 
And the reason why we start with leadership is because without this component, nothing else will work, nothing else will matter, nothing else is genuine in what you're doing to be inclusive as a business. So uh, it all starts with that attitude and ideology that you establish for your business uh, through your leadership. An inclusive culture is not something you can fake or manufacture as an image, and you can't prescribe it to your staff either. You can't uh, make it a top-down approach. Uh, it has to be something that you embody your, yourself as a leader of the company, uh, and your style should be open, accepting, inclusive, uh, and fair to all. So, you know, it's important to let everyone know that you are committed to creating a safe work environment for anyone to express their values and bring up any concerns. Uh, and then your job is to deal with them in a human fashion to resolve those issues for mutual success. So that's, you know, just because somebody says, hey, I, I feel there's a problem here and that it, there's, it's not inclusive to my community, that's valid and we want to hear that. And then we have a discussion with everyone to make sure that that's resolved. It's not just, okay, well, we have to change everything to suit you either. It's, it's about doing it together. Uh, so regardless of whether you're a company of one or a company of a hundred, these attitudes are what you want, need to embody and then demonstrate in the rest of your business practices to be an inclusive business. So let's look at the next consideration. Staffing and hiring is what we traditionally think of uh, when we talk about business inclusivity, because, you know, it's about having representation in your company. Um, your business is a micro community and you need to consider the diversity of that. When most of the voices in your organization come from the same circumstances or experiences or culture, it can be difficult for somebody who's in a minority to feel like they fit in uh, and their opinions or input may be devalued simply based on the kind of majority rules attitude. Uh, you know, it's easier also to have blind spots in your marketplace in what you're doing to market your business when you lack diversity in your own staff to be aware of other communities and their considerations uh, and worse of all, if you are perceived as being racially or ethnically or culturally centric in your company, your appeal to a larger market may be negatively affected. So these all sound like, you know, considerations for a small to medium enter enterprise business with a staff of at least 10, uh, but even smaller companies, partnerships or solopreneurs uh, should consider how they conduct business as part of their culture because they're still in a network. They're still in a community of suppliers, service providers, distribution partners, uh, and they can represent your, your uh, inclusion as well in your inclusion strategy to represent diversity. So uh, an example of this for me is that I have a couple of different printing companies that I will go to with jobs. Uh, and there's one that's local to me that is a couple of island guys and they're so warm and welcoming. And I like the fact that they are a small business like me and I would rather work with them than a larger outfit of a printing house franchisee, which I find is very white corporate Canada. So, uh, you know, it's important to me to support other small businesses and other communities and other cultures in my supply chain as a business, even though I'm only a company of one. So it's something to consider. Uh, your policies and practices are very important as well in expressing and, and representing your uh, inclusion strategy. So um, I've got a client who is a trucking company and, and one of the largest trucking companies in the country. Uh, and I do newsletters for them and I do magazines for them. And they're always sending me uh, poster jobs or pictures of events where they're saying, you know, we're, we're honoring and we're observing Ramadan or Diwali or other cultural uh, holiday celebrations that are not native to my you know, Canadian experience. But I think it's fantastic. They recognize that so many of their staff are observing these holidays and they want to be inclusive and show them that they value that. Um, so that's you know, very important to do. Whether it, again, even if it's just you in your company, you can post on social media, you know, I'm happy to celebrate Ramadan with my neighbors. So, you know, it's, it's a way to show that you're uh, welcoming and accepting their cultures. Another thing for your policies and practices is ensuring accessibility for all. And, uh, you know, again, Brett, feel free to speak up on this. Um, what, where I understand it is not just in, you know, the physical location and making sure that there are accessibility ramps and doors and things like that, but also in the, in the digital world, and, and probably Sean can comment, 
Um, you need to show that your website is has accessibility options for enlarging the text, for having images with captions so that if somebody is uh, has a sight impairment, their computer is reading it back to them, they're not being left out of what the images are showing. Uh, so there's a lot of different aspects of, of consideration for accessibility for people with disabilities. Um, when I was in corporate Canada, working with a, a, a brokerage company, there was a lot of consideration being managed at that time with French versus English because it was a national company. And if you did things in English only, then the Montreal staff would be upset. Uh, to this day and age, we have my other uh, trucking company putting out materials in three languages, English, French, and Punjabi. And even though everybody in the company does speak English, they are showing them the consideration and the respect of using their native languages uh, to make it easier for them and to show that they welcome it. Um, and so the next point is meeting practices. And I've seen a couple of things in the last few months that are new and different and inclusive. And I think it's worth mentioning. One is that um, a lot of meetings are now starting with a land acknowledgement statement about uh, the land trust that we've been given from the Mississauga Indians and so on and so forth. Uh, and it's just, when I first heard it, I was sort of surprised to think, uh, wow, this is new and I've seen it in print as well, but I think it's valuable, you know, just to, to recognize that this land is one that we are using and not owning um, and, and acknowledging that the uh, cultures that came before us are stewards of the land. And the other practice that I've seen um, in a larger capacity lately is that on a Zoom call like this, people are putting after their name, they're putting in brackets the pronouns that they want to be addressed by. And, uh, you know, in some circles, it's a touchy subject. But for me, I say, you know, just clarity is good. Clarity is good no matter what it is. So my name would be Damon Adachi, bracket, he, him. So that if you're going to address me with my pronouns, you know which ones I prefer. It's new, it's different, it's it's part of the ever evolving world of uh, the social landscape and to be inclusive is, is just easy in that sense. Uh, and lastly, I think it's super important for a business in their policies and practices to have an inclusion statement uh, to some effect in their website, in their charter, in their mission statement, just to make it known that the leadership has taken this consideration seriously and have a stance that they they hold as a standard in their company. Any input at this point? Has anybody seen those things that I mentioned? Yeah, um, I'll jump in, Damon. Um, I know on our website, for example, we use a product called Browse Aloud, which allows not only, you know, fonts being increased, but for people who may not be able to read, they can just basically drag the cursor over some text and it'll automatically read back to them. So it's another way to uh, make sure that your your website's uh, accessible. And uh, I've run into that same challenge you talked about with translating where you said, uh, you know, you went through Punjabi. We, um, being a, a publicly funded organization or mainly funded through, through the government, we had to um, um, make sure that we were bilingual. But the challenge we had was that French is like number 12 in Peel region as far as language spoken. And we wanted to hit like the top eight. So we were translating our things into Punjabi, Urdu, Cantonese, like all these other languages way before we wanted to spend the money on French, but it, it was, it's mandatory. So that, I think that's key. You really need to know your audience because we are limited to Mississauga. I mean, it's, it's much easier. And if you're going across Canada, then obviously you've got a much bigger, um, grouping to pull from but it's important to know who your audience is and while you may be required to do French there's some other languages that you may get more bang for your buck with exactly great great input anyone else? I had Go ahead. sorry Damon I had noticed that uh, the acknowledgement of the lands that they were occupying uh, when I was watching something on YouTube about two years ago this was out of New Zealand or Australia that trend had started. I, I, I haven't noticed that in North America, but uh, I guess you have noticed that. I noticed that about two years ago out of New Zealand and Australia, where they were acknowledging the land that they were from the from the Aborigines uh, that, that they were occupying. Um, it's certainly an inter interesting concept. I am going to try to implement what you had said about the pictures uh, having descriptive uh, um, stuff on my website and uh, I had originally way back when tried to 
be more um, like when I started in 20, 2006, six seven, tried to do a more inclusive website, but wasn't wasn't getting many much response. But I guess this is this is the particular. Uh, it is it is um, it is it is more current at this time to to, to do that. Thanks, Satish. Uh, okay, so what we hit so far with leadership, staffing, and policies and practices. Uh, I understand that it sounds like it's speaking to a larger organization, but this next section I think is very applicable to everybody here um, because your brand doesn't matter how big a company you are, it's, it's important for everyone. So your brand has two major components, one being your image and the other one being your message. Uh, and each of them has various elements to it. So we're gonna look at those two groups individually. Um, in your brand image, you have things like uh, the name of your company, the logo that you use, uh, the design elements that support all of that. Uh, and most importantly, in this topic, you have uh, photos of people uh, in your marketing materials. And those photos of people should represent the diversity that exists in your marketplace. Uh, it's important to audit the imagery that you're using in your, in your marketing materials to ensure that those people shown are an accurate representation of not only your organization, but your community uh, and your market. It can be included, it can be demonstrated by including people of color, people with disabilities, equal representation of women, uh, equal representation of the elderly, uh, and even all body types. And it's funny that, you know, a huge part of my job for my clients is sourcing the right images um, and finding that feel and that message that shows up visually. Uh, and it's, it's a, an exercise every time to make sure that there's diversity expressed, there is realistic looking people, uh, not just, you know, 21 year old models. Um, and, it, you know, originally, 10 years ago, people wanted happy, shiny looking people that represented the best. Um, but in the last five years, it's really been about, you know what, it's almost offensive to our market. If you're only showing uh, model type people, we want to see real human beings, we want to see all shapes, all colors, all ages, all sizes, and all abilities. Uh, so that's something that I've really uh, become aware of. And it, even for clients who are not expecting it, I'm always thinking about, okay, but you know, you can't just have that toothpaste commercial girl in every picture. It has to be, you know, something that rep represents your market. Um, and what I would hearken back to is, I don't know if anybody else remembers it like this, but for me, when the black entertainment channel came up on on my you know tv and it was in the bet channel i would see some commercials on that for mcdonald's that had black people in it and i was and i was shocked like it wasn't even something i was aware of but the first time you see it you're like wow that's i just suddenly realized that i've only ever seen white people in mcdonald's commercials and those commercials are only being run on that channel and today the representation is so much better and so much more diverse and inclusive but that has to continue to be part of the, the fourth foresight and the, and the thought that goes into how you're marketing. Um, that I, I think is, a, a, you know, we've made huge strides and, and even though the events of 2020 sort of made us step back and, and question whether we are systemically racist in this country, I think we sort of ignored some of the big steps forward that we've also made lately. So. Um, it's great to see that uh, marketing is, is reflecting that and art is imitating life in that sense. Uh, so the other half of your brand is your message uh, and it's your mission statement, it's your slogan, uh, but it really importantly, it's your social media dialogue. Um, and it's critically important to keep your inclusion ideology in mind whenever posting to social media and stay in the realm of being empathetic and aware without hopefully without treading into activism or any kind of social agenda like you should separate uh, your professional and your personal accounts it's great to celebrate and support different communities in your marketplace without alienating any others uh, so you have to make sure that as an entrepreneur your clients are also going to see both sides right they're going to see your business side they're going to see your personal side uh, and they're going to understand that one reflects on the other so i saw a uh, a fledgling company recently who was in social media. They're a social media support person and they help you with posting and with images and with tone and messaging. And under that same brand, 
they showed some pictures of their recent hunting trip. And I scratched my head and said, you know, that's going to offend a lot of people. Uh, and that wasn't, you know, as a business who is in the, in the industry of social media, that was a huge faux pas, in my opinion. So, you know, keeping those professional and personal accounts separate is very important. Uh, and still remembering that one will reflect on the other in no matter how you separate them. Uh, so what I suggest for larger companies and even for smaller companies is to outline and document the tone and voice that you want anyone who is responsible, responsible for posting in your organization on social media to use uh, when re representing the business so that everybody is upholding that, that standard of inclusion. And another aspect of your brand message is goodwill and community involvement. Um, the way in which you support your community through those goodwill activities. Donating and volunteering for organizations through money and time represent uh, a very strong statement to your market about your inclusion. So um, it's, it's great to say things, but you know, to uh, walk the walk is important and to show people that you do that is, uh, is very strong in your efforts towards being an inclusive business. Any more input from the group? Yeah, I think TELUS does a really, really good job of showing their brand without getting into people, right? TELUS is all about the cute little animals and birds and stays very much away from some of those issues. So I think and it was that, a good choice on their behalf. Yes, especially when you're a national company and there's a very different demographic as you go from one end of the, com of the country to the other. So yes, brilliant, you're absolutely right. I think a key too is you, you've got to put yourself in in the other person's shoes, not necessarily just the message you want to get across, but think about how that's going to be looked at fr from the other side. Um, I know when Damon's done some design work for us, you know, he would say, here's an image I like, and we'd come back and say, like, for example, the pins he has in those, um, in the, the image up in the top of the, the slide here. A lot of times you have sort of, you know, like a partial person with, you know, the head standing on its own. Well, in our organization, showing a head separated from the body can come across in our field as, you know, it's not a complete person. There's a disconnect between what's going on here and the rest of, so we would never use a disconnected head image or icon, right? So you have to sort of see how that would be looked at from the other side. And then if, another thing is, is learning the language of the, the areas because whereas in our organization, we don't say people with a disability, it's people who have a disability up until a year ago, it was individuals who had a, an intellectual disability. And that language, it, it's in constant flux. And that's a challenge for you as a marketer, I think, is always being aware of what is the new acceptable language? Is it person of color? Is it a black person? Is it, you know, what, what is it? And being able to adapt all your, your, your marketing materials to reflect that. Mm -hmm. and, and I have some input on social media dialogue. It's interesting that um, it's interesting that Damon uh, mentioned that because my social media, I sort of wear my politics on my sleeve and sort of um, uh, have to be a little more sensitive to uh, how all my clients would view or potential clients would view who I am on Facebook or who I am on. I'm pretty much only on Facebook. I think my LinkedIn is pretty clean. Um, but how that would uh, look at, uh, how that would come across to a, a w wide spectrum of, uh, of clients. So, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll watch my Facebook a little <laughs> bit more. Yeah, and if I could, if I would just throw in, right? Like, so I think there's two parts to it, right? As, as and I'll, I'll fully admit my, my bias and privilege, but as a white male, in a leadership role in an organization. I think a lot of the time we have like, like an expectation both outside and inside that we can fix stuff, right? Like, ah, just go ask them, they'll fix it, right? And some of this we can't, right? Like the, some of this stuff can be challenging and intimidating in that, you know, we think like, oh, you know, I don't know how to solve this and then I'm going to come up with ideas and you got to ask, right? Like I, I can't tell, you know, people of, you know, people of color or people of, you know, with, with, you know, individuals with disabilities or, or, you know, members of the, the 2S to, I don't know what the answer is, right. And you've got to talk to them, right. And we're, 
we're fighting this locally right now a little bit with with wanting to raise the pride flag in june and you've got a whole bunch of old white men at the table who don't want to raise the pride flag and are trying to tell people of this community that no here this is what we're going to do for you it's like you got to listen to them um is is part one of it and then part two of it is you got to live it right like you you cannot you know the, the only thing worse than not being inclusive is coming across like putting it out there that you're inclusive and not being right you, you've got to live it and you know bell bell got absolutely crap kicked because shortly after their Bell Let's Talk Day, where they get all this free advertising and publicity, they whacked a whole bunch of long-term employees, right? So you gotta, this, this has to be front and center. You've got to live this, right? You can't, you know, simply changing your logo to a rainbow for the month of June or, you know, putting up hashtag BLM, that, that doesn't cut the mustard, right? You gotta live this. You gotta, you gotta recognize that, you know, forget the fact that it's good business. It's just, it's the right thing to do. Right? <laughs> and yet you, you got to live it. So. Well said. Just, just do, do I get a chance? So. Sure. Um, so for, you know, for me, when I was looking at it, let's say from the late eighties through the nineties, uh, inclusion meant just wanting to be included, but you can see that in the last 10 to 15 years, Inclusion has gone from just wanting to be included to acceptance. The dialogue around inclusion as, as people have become slightly more, seemingly slightly more militant or, um, and, and, and also the, 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 the corporate culture has changed around this. It is not so much about, hey, let's have this person, let's have that person. As Damon has said, it's not about hiring practices. It is you, you inclusion is going gone from just hey let's include these people to let's get to the other stage the the sort of like the end goal which is acceptance and that is from and as I see from this presentation while I am myself sort of lacking my my website my 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 social media presence seems uh, seems a little too aggressive but at least on Facebook but. It is sort of gratifying that the whole inclusion dialogue has gone from just the word inclusion all the way to inclusion being about acceptance, and and that is that is a transformation that when I, my mind in the late '80s, early '90s was well, just being included was okay, but I had never sort of thought that the whole that step to acceptance would would come. W would be there as early as it has it has come into corporate culture so it is sort of gratifying to see and i think it would even go beyond acceptance into celebrating and that's what's you know especially inspiring for me yeah i think even even beyond that i know when i speak uh, on behalf of organizational lot, i'll say you know inclusion used to be being invited to the dance and then all of a sudden it shifted to being invited to the dance and being asked to dance by somebody while you were there. But I think where we need to go is inclusion is being invited to be a part of the planning committee for the dance so that your voice is being heard overall, not just that you're standing there, not that you're participating, but you are actively involved in helping to create that community. Yeah, that's a great analogy. And, and it's, it's, Brett, go ahead. Hey, Brett, can I steal that analogy? You have Absolutely. A or anything I don't got to pay you. <laughs> I, I, that that is probably one of the most profound things i've i've heard somebody say in a long time that's awesome Thanks. and it's challenging because we are in a melting pot and it's not just one group that we have to focus on including and you know it's just there's so many considerations but that's the goal that is the goal is to have everybody part of the the vision before it even comes to life so fantastic stuff guys okay Let's move on to the benefits. Um, why, why is this important for your company, for your brand, and for you as an individual? Uh, let's, let's start in basic business terms. Inclusion engages your community. When you demonstrate it and, and foster diversity, you're really creating an opportunity to resonate with your target market. Um, especially like we said, in a cultural melting pot like Ontario, you know, that's, that's, that's key to your success. Acknowledging and celebrating other cultures and communities leads to a better understanding of your market. 
uh, and allows you to become better at identifying their needs and adding value to your offering for their group. So, uh, you know, exactly what we've just been saying. If they, if they feel like they've been considered from the start of the offering, they're way more likely to engage and become clients. Uh, it can also help attract great candidates if you're looking to grow your team. Uh, and it's becoming more common for both employees and applicants to ask and inquire uh, about their the inclusion practices of the company that they are either working for or applying to. So, uh, you know, it's, it's really about being connected to your community. The second key benefit that we'll talk about is that it actually drives profitability. Uh, so I'll read some stats here that I found. Companies in the top quartile for ethnic diversity at the executive level are 33% more likely to have above average profitability than companies in the bottom quartile. And when it comes to gender diversity, companies in the top quartile are 21% more likely to have above average profitability than those in the bottom. So that's according to McKinsey's 2018 research. But you know, what does this mean? How do we explain this? Well, ultimately, a positive corporate culture creates happy, productive team members who feel engaged, who give more, which results in higher profitability for the company. So, you know, those are some kind of uh, top line, bottom line uh, reinforcement numbers to show that diversity is not just goodwill, it pays back for the company and helps you be a stronger organization. Uh, and lastly, an inclusive practice uh, attitude protects your business reputation. Uh, and we've, we've glanced over this a couple of times, but I want to sort of dive into it a little more uh, in depth. Uh, by establishing these policies and practices and even the goodwill that you do, you, uh, you uh, insulate your business from those that feel the need to point out shortcomings or oversights in your operations. Uh, you know, even an innocent social media post might be misconstrued, misinterpreted as discriminatory and called out in the public forum. Uh, and if you don't have these policies in place, if you haven't walked the walk as much as talk the talk, uh, then you can find yourself in, in a bad place. But if you've done these things that we've mentioned previously, you can actually stand proudly behind your business and prove that you value inclusion. So I'll give you an example. Uh, the company that I've been working for in the last few months, uh, Goldline Curling, has made a lot of efforts in their United We Curl campaign to include uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and even the, uh, the LGBTQ community into the game of curling. And I, you know, it's, it's inspiring because they have taken a topic that hasn't really been discussed and wasn't being discussed and wasn't even high on the awareness list of the fact that curling is predominantly a white affluent sport, right? It is where golf was 30 years ago. Um, and they've said, we want to be the spearhead of the change and changing the face of the game. They put money into this. They are not going to see come back in any kind of sales. Uh, they put time and effort. They started a campaign. They included people from the community and they showed that they were a leader in their community. Uh, and that is what separated them from a number of competitors who are starting to dive into their market share and erode some of their profits. And it has really changed their reputation in the industry. Uh, and so much so that while I'm working on this stuff with them and designing brooms for some of the, uh, the, the cultures that are represented, I'm putting together a schedule of, of events coming up in an, in, an, uh, pardon me, in an international event. And I went to put Japan as a short form and I put J-A-P and I'm Japanese <laughs> and I didn't get offended by that but it came back red flagged pretty quickly on social media that that is offensive as a term of Jap uh, and the short form for Japan should be J-P-N. Well it was a quick and easy fix but because of their credentials and because of their clout that they have in this whole campaign there was no you know, how could they do that? How could they be so insensitive? How could that be an oversight that they would allow to happen? It was just like, okay, you know, people make mistakes. And we know that Goldline is a company that really does value inclusion and represent it for the sport uh, in, in terms of diversity. So it gives you the opportunity to have, uh, you know, some credit in times when you can't always be perfect. And you're going to, you're going to offend or at least step on a toe here or there once in a while. But when you have the practices and the policies in place that you can show that this is important to you, you get a bit of grace. It's always touching, everybody knows that. So I, I would 
say maybe you could look at it like a health and safety standards where you have to take these things seriously. You have to have policies and practices in place to avoid potentially harmful negligence. Uh, you know, you don't ever plan for anyone to get hurt, but by not being proactive, you are accountable regardless of your good intentions. And I think that's the message is that every one of us should be considering what our inclusion statement looks like and publishing it somewhere as your insurance policy against somebody coming after you. And there are people that are out there that are just looking to cause trouble and looking to be the first person to point out a mistake to make themselves feel good. So be proactive, don't be reactive. And, you know, I'm really encouraged by the dialogue in this room that, that our members feel strongly about this and they feel the right way about this is that it is an evolution we welcome and that we want to be a part of and that we want to champion. Uh, so that's what I have in terms of benefits. And I'll summarize and then we'll open the floor to a discussion. Being inclusive in your business is not an option, it's a necessity. And we've shown why, we've proven why in this discussion. The benefits that you will realize are a much stronger engagement with your market. That's better for your business, it's better for your marketing. Uh, your operations can see higher profitability from a more diverse approach. Uh, and you can protect your brand reputation that you've worked so hard to establish with the service and the operations that you that you undertake. Uh, but of course, above all, the reason why we want this is because it helps make the world a better place in whatever small way we can do as, as uh, entrepreneurs and business owners. That's what I've got, folks. It was a, you know, a great presentation for me to put together. I've been involved in so many things with my clients that are in this vein of um, of being aware and walking the right line and setting an example and being a leader in each in each individual area. Uh, so it has really become a huge issue for me in my business. And I wanted to share that as something that I think we can all benefit from uh, because we can all very easily be in our own bubble of getting our jobs done and, and either being exposed to something that we're not aware of or just missing an opportunity to do good. Anyone want to comment? Yeah, well, I think one thing. Sorry, go ahead, Tim. Um, I find as a 50 year old white guy, the lines moved in my life about as much as anybody on this call. And uh, my kids are constantly encouraging me to move along with the line. And this was valuable because, again, although I think I've moved my line up when I think of my website. I don't think that there's a line in there that is kept up with today's challenges. So Damon, I'm going to have some work for you, but uh, I found that very valuable. It was again, one of those unique topics that you don't get anywhere else, but for a 50 year old white guy that runs a business of, you know, wealthy people of all makes models and stuff like that. I think it is something that I have to more consciously bring in but again with some delicacy i'm i'm not going to get up and start a commercial about blm because i don't think that i've got the clout to do that but being accepting of it um, and embracing it i think is the way to go in this stage so i'm i'm learning this was a really good uh, thing for me and uh, i appreciate all the input without the pokes and like I agree, the, um, the information was insightful. It makes you step back and realize that really, as much as we believe in all of, all of this, of course, as you know, no prejudice in LGBTQ, all, all of that, um, really the social media aspect of my world does not reflect any of that. So it makes me think about what does that look like uh, from my business perspective. So thank you. I think Damon's just creating some work to do everybody's websites in this. Did anybody think of that? Absolutely. Tim, going into a, one thing that you mentioned there at the end, I think Damon was your last point as well was, you know, like you're making the world a better place. And, you know, Tim, what you put on your website may not change everything, but if it's part of a collective, then it's an overall change across the board that, that happens. And then everybody ends up benefiting. I know when I was, uh, Going, using another curling analogy, when I was president of the Brampton Curling Club, 
we were trying to encourage younger people to curl. And so we put a discount in place for young curlers, you know, even, you know, teenagers, they're going to come and curl for free just so they get into the sport. And the argument we got from the older curlers is, well, they're going to go to college in Ottawa and we're never going to see them again. But the fact was we've created curlers and they're going to go curl in Ottawa now. And then maybe in Ottawa, they're going to have the same sort of plan because they want to grow the sport. And those people are going to move to Brampton and Mississauga. So they're going to curl with us instead. So it becomes a, a movement beyond just your organization when you're creating a better place across the board, then everybody benefits down the road. Even if you can't see the return on investment right away for your business, I think it's going to happen long term. Hey, Brett. Fastest ice I've ever played on in Brampton. Can be quick. Crazy. I think um, the, the thing we have to remember is that cultures naturally gravitate to each other. You know, that's why you get pockets of Greek town and Chinatown. It's like people want to be around like-minded, like-cultured, and it becomes natural to us, even in business, to start to do business with the people that look like us, talk like us, sound like us, do the same things we do, like curling. <laughs> so it, it becomes very easy to fall into a silo. And I think it's just in our best interest to remember to keep those lines open to other cultures, other experiences, and not just immediately tighten up when you hear, oh, you know, we want to fly the pride flag at the top of the building. Well, great. Why not? Like, so what? <laughs> how does that hurt anybody? It only helps, right? So I think that, you know, we can't beat ourselves up either. Like even within this group, we're aware that we are 80% male, 80% white, 80%, all these things. We understand that that's just the way that things have gravitated for our group. And we make, uh, we make, we put effort into expanding and becoming more diverse, not for the sake of it, not for, you know, hey, we just need more people of color in this group just so that we don't look bad. That's not our goal. Our goal is to find great people, but we are welcoming and opening to anybody who's, who's interested in joining, you know? So that's, it's, you're right, Tim, there is a line and you move with the line and you don't, overshoot it and put yourself in any kind of liability either and you don't fall so far behind it that you are out of touch so this is just you know a, an attempt to let everybody see where the line is today and keep an eye on it moving forward satish you have something to say yeah i just want to say how, like how fortunate we are sort of to have a, a sort of a culture that makes an effort to be inclusive i mean i come from a society or i ran away from a society where there was no effort to um, include uh, our ethnic minority. Um, uh, we were we were tolerated, sort of kind of thing. And if if you will indulge me, I, I'm next uh, in two weeks. I'll talk about a documentary about that. But we're so lucky to be in Canada, where I can all, I can think of a handful of countries: New Zealand, maybe Australia, Canada. I can't think of many countries in Europe. Uh, maybe England, uh, but England did Brexit. But that's for various a variety of reasons, but that makes a conscious effort to be inclusive. And I am certainly lucky to be here and uh, fortunate where, where the doors keep opening for me. Um, and so fortunate to be here in Canada. I, I honestly can't think of too many countries where this level of tolerance and this level of effort is being made for inclusion, for the purposes of inclusion. I, I can't think of, I, I can only think of, you know, New Zealand, Australia, and I'm not the most knowledgeable person on this, but I, I can't think of many countries. You know, it, Satish, I'll, I'll throw this out there. So my dad and I used to talk about this regularly, right? My dad immigrated here from Ireland. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be born in this country. <clears throat> but my dad always said, like, they had a built-in advantage as Irish immigrants in that if he never opened his mouth, nobody knew he wasn't Canadian, quote unquote, right? Because they understood the language. And as long as he didn't speak with it, he would put it his stupid accent, you were able to work and get by, right? And, you know, you, you talk about tolerance, but, you know, I, I think we're so fortunate that, you know, people like you come to this country because there's such value and greatness in Canada in a whole bunch of different types of people coming together and, and you often find that it the sum of the parts is so much greater, right? Um, and and I hate the word tolerate. You know, I, I and I, I 
I, I can't begin to imagine some of the things that you experience in this country as, as a new immigrant, but I, I hope 20 or 30 or 40 years from now that we're not talking about tolerating people and we're talking about celebrating them. So. 